Hey, my name's Brent. Welcome back to 49cc Scoot and the TPR86cc Build Series. In the last video, I installed a 30mm high velocity electron carburetor as well as a Polini 360 degree intake and a new air filter setup. I began to start tuning those. Unfortunately, I caused an issue and was only getting three quarter throttle roughly when I set up the carburetor because I was trying to get a more stiff return and I actually restricted it while I was working on that. I figured that part out and got wide open throttle and then when I went to go tune, I had at least a couple of fails. So first off, the kickstart failed and left me stranded. Um, then I discovered that the variator ramp plate has actually chewed through part of the crankshaft, took all of the splines off of one section of the crankshaft. And on top of that, I have dark coolant uh, in my reservoir and it appears that I must be leaking combustion pressure, combustion gases into the coolant. So I've got a bunch of stuff that I need to take care of before I can even go back to tuning the Electron and hopefully get this thing dialed in. I'm assuming I have an O-ring failure or possibly the aluminum rings that I installed in the cylinder head a while back to try and fix an issue that I've had with these cylinder heads breaking a thin wall uh, between the combustion chamber and the studs. Maybe that has failed, but the first thing I need to do is get the cylinder head off and find out for sure what's up. Aside from this one that I damaged when removing it, all of the O-rings look pretty good to me. These are the ones that I really thought would be the point of failure, these smaller black O-rings. They go around the cylinder studs between the cylinder and the inner cylinder head, and they're a little smaller because of the modification I made to my cylinder head. I figured that would probably be the issue. They all look good, they're not pinched, no sort of damage. These are the ones that go on top, um, no damage there at all that I can see. That's the bore o-ring. It's got some burnt stuff on there, but kind of expect that. Um, and otherwise, looks fine to me. Outer o-ring looks fine, but I didn't really expect that to be an issue because it wasn't leaking coolant outside of the cylinder. Checking out the intersection of the cylinder head, I do see a spot here and a spot here that are clean. I don't think there are any problem though because I don't notice anything inside of these bores if combustion pressure was coming out this way into them i would assume that i should see residue inside of the bore here where the o-ring sits and they look to be pretty clean the only thing i really notice is right down here at the bottom and you can see all around here you can tell where the head was in contact and down here at the bottom it looks pretty cleaned off Looking at the top of the cylinder, when I check out where the stud and bore o-rings are, I can see lines of separation there on every single stud. So it really doesn't look like the failure points were right there as I suspected. Once again though, right here at the bottom of the cylinder, you can see that I've got some gas and oil pooling down there, which something like that could happen when you pull a cylinder apart because naturally everything's going to drip down. But You'll also notice you don't have all the evidence of contact here that you've got all the way around the rest of the cylinder. So it appears to me that the leak must have occurred down here at the bottom of the cylinder. I think this may just be one of those deals where stuff happens and it didn't seal. But I want to make sure there's nothing going on that the head or the cylinder isn't warped. So what I'm going to do is just use a straight edge. And I'm going to start with a light. Try to shine that through the flat spots. It's normal to see light. Obviously, you're going to see light coming through the bore o-ring and things like that. But you don't want to see any light coming through if it's on a flat surface when your straight edge is pushed square against it. So right now, I'm not seeing anything. If I did see a little light coming through somewhere, what I could do is press this straight edge flat against the surface and then take a feeler gauge and just make sure it doesn't go under there. Usually, you want to use something thin like maybe one to two thousandths of an inch. You want to make sure you check the head thoroughly, so don't just check one way. I like to go across the stud holes, check that way, 
Then I'll go diagonal the other way and take a look. Go straight across this way, go all around the edges. Make sure you check everything out very thoroughly. And again, if you see light coming through and you can get a feeler gauge through there, then you may have a warped head. You want to do the same thing to the cylinder surface. Same exact process. In this case, I haven't taken this apart. I'm trying to keep this together as much as I can because I don't believe I've got any problems going on other than the ceiling issue up here. But same process. Go around there the best you can. Shine a light under there. Use feeler gauges if you need to. Also, it's important to clean these areas up, the surfaces up. You don't want a bunch of gasket residue on there because that can skew your results. You may think it's warped and it turns out you were just running into some gasket material that's left over or something like that. But the good news for me is I'm not seeing any signs of warping here. I was ready to get the top end back together, do a leak test, and move along. But then I started reading the comments on one of my last videos, specifically comments by user Bravo1412. What he says is that he has done at least 20 of these TPR kits, and he's only had ceiling issues like I'm having one time, so he believes that this is my fault because I'm applying too much torque or too much clamping force. He suggests that I use 11 newton meters as my torque spec for the cylinder nuts. I've been using 12.5, and TPR says 12 plus or minus 1 newton meter. So technically both of us are correct within TPR's specs, but he advises the low end of the specs. Now I think I have probably actually been well on the high end, not for the torque value specifically, but for clamping force. And let me explain a little bit. So TPR does not specify whether these torque specs are dry, meaning no lubricant, or what lubricant to use. So it could be something like motor oil or a Molly kind of lube or some specific type of lubricant. They don't specify anything. They just give you a torque spec, which is also common in scooter service manuals from what I've seen. They make no specification of how this is done. So I suppose you would naturally assume if there is no specification for a lubricant, then it'd be done dry. However, I have been using motor oil when I do this. And I put motor oil on the threads of the stud as well as on the flange of the nut. And the reason for that is you have friction between the threads of the stud and the threads of the nut. And then you also have friction between the flange of the nut or the base of the nut and the top of the head or whatever that is mating against when they try to rotate against each other. So by using any sort of lubricant, you are reducing the amount of friction and you also reduce the amount of torque required to get to any sort of uh, tension or clamping force. So I'm probably putting a lot more clamping force on my cylinder by using oil than someone that does this dry. He goes on to say that I'm also incorrect for retorquing my cylinder nuts. So let me clarify what I normally do. I will torque the cylinder down just as I've talked about. I give it time to cure because I usually use some sort of thin coating of sealant on the base gasket. I do a leak or a pressure test. Once it passes, then I'll get the engine running. I take it down the road, get everything up to operating temp. I get the coolant temps up. I get the CHT up. I bring it back home and then I let it sit until it cools to room temperature or ambient temperature. Then I will retorque the fasteners. Now retorquing for me at this point is usually just going over them with the same setting that I was using on the torque wrench and turning them until they click once more because usually they will loosen up. Now you can also back off the nuts. It's actually recommended by a lot of people to back off a fastener before you retorque it because you have, I believe it's called breakaway torque. That friction that's there between everything kind of fights so you may not, it may not move unless it's kind of far from the value that you're shooting for. I don't do this anymore because with my first liquid cooled setup, it seemed like when I would break any of the nuts loose, it would be more likely that I may have a leak later. Um, I'm assuming something must, start of, must have started seeping through when I broke something free. Um, so I just quit breaking them loose and I just go over them quickly. 
and make sure that the uh, wrench clicks, the torque wrench clicks on each of the nuts in a crisscross pattern. What he's saying is that by doing this, I'm causing way too much clamping force on everything because the cylinder, the head, everything expands when it's heated and then it contracts when it cools, everything distorts, etc. And he's saying that the manufacturer doesn't list a spec because they intend for it to be this way. They're accounting for what happens, any base gasket compression or any gasket compression, etc. They're accounting for this when they give you the initial torque spec. They don't want it retorqued. I've always thought, and from automotive experience in the past, that it relates a lot to gasket settling. And once that gasket settles, then you should retorque to keep the same amount of tension on there when the engine is cool. Um, but he's saying once you retorque, you're then clamping everything together a little more tightly and it's more tightly than intended. So then when everything starts to expand again, it can't expand the way it should without distorting more. And then you're going to cause yourself issues. So at this point, I'm still going to stick with retorquing. I just believe that's how it really should be. I'm not claiming to be correct. I'm saying that's what I believe right now. However, I am going to back down the torque that I apply when I initially install the head and when I retorque it. I'm going to go with 11 newton meters by his spec and I'm not going to lubricate the threads this time because I think that may be closer to the manufacturer's intention. And it made me think that with all of the application of torque or clamping force that I'm putting on the, uh, the cylinder head and the cylinder, Perhaps that is why I have cracked cylinder heads, um, those thin walls between the stud and the bore rings. Maybe I'm applying enough torque that, or enough clamping force that it does become too much and they can't take it and that's why I'm cracking them and other people aren't. While I'm at it, I want to cover this as well. Bravo also commented later that my RPM is too high and that I need to get the RPM down because I'm not making peak power. I'm revving beyond peak power. He says that the TPR kit should be making peak power around 12,800 RPM, but I'm revving up to 13 and a half, 14,000 RPM, so I'm just not making the power that I should, and I need to get the RPM down. Now, this is kind of off topic, but I just wanted to address this while I'm at it because it's something that I've heard so many times in so many of my video comments. A lot of people believe that they know what's best for this, and I absolutely am over revving it all the time. I need to try heavier roller weights or sliders. I need to use a softer contra spring. Whatever the case may be, I just need to get that RPM down. I need to be, say, whatever number. People have different numbers, but it usually tends to be around 12 to 13,000 RPM. I'm not sure if all of you have seen a lot of the videos in this series, or maybe you're just watching them here and there. But if you go back and watch a lot of the videos, you'll find that in some cases, I am going to great lengths to do a lot of tests with various rollers or in my case slider weights in the CVT or in the variator. And what I do is I tend to do 0 to 30, 40 and 50 mile per hour runs and I record the RPM at 30, 40 and 50 miles per hour. I record the elapsed time to get there and I put all that data into a spreadsheet. I don't keep everything, all the runs that I do because it's just too many, but I do keep uh, a good selection of runs that I've done over time, the things that I think give me the most data, and I can look through that and by what I see there, I can tell, say it's very slow to 30 miles per hour when I'm revving to 12,500 RPM, however, it's quick to 30 miles per hour when I'm revving to say 13,500 RPM and then it slows down again when I'm revving to 14,000 RPM. So I can look at that data and say, okay, the engine seems to like about 13,500 RPM. I can do the same thing at 40 and 50 miles per hour and say, well, it looks like when I can keep it about 13,500 RPM that I get to 40 miles per hour more quickly or 50 miles per hour more quickly or transition from 40 to 50 miles per hour more quickly, whatever the case is, I can look through the data that I have and I can see where the engine is working the best. So regardless of what anybody tells me about what works for them, 
what they say in any book or specification about TPR, etc. I can tell you in the real world what is actually working for my setup. And I mean no offense by this, but I really don't care what anybody tells me works best for my setup because I have tested it extensively. I have put a lot of time into this. A lot of people have said it about my top speed that I'm revving too high at speed. I need to get the RPM down there. I don't necessarily disagree because sometimes I'm revving 14,000 or more RPM when I'm at my max speed. But for me, it's really all about acceleration. I enjoy the 0 to 30, 40, 50 miles per hour more than anything on this scooter. And a snappy throttle response. I like that it picks the wheel up, stuff like that. I will not sacrifice any performance down there for top end speed. It just doesn't worry me. I don't ride around wide open throttle at 70 whatever miles per hour. I do, however, take off a lot and enjoy doing that. So, again, no offense to anyone that has tried to give me recommendations there, but please don't think that I haven't tested this and don't have results to back up what I have in here. So, moving along, let me get back to working on the engine. The O-ring doesn't want to stay put inside of its groove no matter what I try. So I'm going to do the same thing I did last time. I'm going to use a little bit of high tack spray a gasket sealant. Spray that on one side of this and then let it set up for a minute. Then I can assemble it into the head and it should stick in there well enough that I can get this together without worrying about it falling out. The cylinder studs have been cleaned, so there should be no residual oil, no grease from the O-rings, no gas concealant, no nothing on there. The nuts have also been cleaned, so again, there shouldn't be anything left over from the uh, last time they were together with oil in the threads. It's actually 9.06 newton meters. This is a inch pound wrench that happens to also have newton meters, so they're not always an even spec. So this will be 11.04 newton meters. Pretty close. And you'll notice I'm trying to do a continuous sweep the best I can, not stop and start. That way I get the most accurate torque setting. And then I just like to go over them one more time to make sure after all the rest, some of the earlier ones haven't settled a little from there. And done. It's been sitting here for 30 minutes without that gauge moving, so I'm going to consider that passing this pressure test. I'm going to turn my attention to the CVT cover and the clutch right now because I've got multiple things to take care of with a CVT cover. Obviously the kickstart, this has stripped out, so I need to replace it and I'll probably go ahead and replace the spring and the whole nine yards when I'm in there. Also there's some play in there, so I assume I need a new bushing. And then here, the bearing for my other support in the CVT cover that these Chinese engines have. You can see I run a bearing in there, but I also use these aluminum uh, bushings that I make up to help not wear the shaft and install it, instead wear the bushings out, but this is clearly worn pretty badly, so I need to get that bearing out of there and replace that bushing. As you can see, I've picked up a bunch of parts to help me get this scooter running and hopefully working well again. 
as well as grab some spares so I'll have them for later. Now everything over here came from four different US sellers and what you're seeing here came from scooterstuning.ca up in Canada. Now I'm from the US so you would assume that this stuff would get here much more quickly but I actually ordered all of this stuff exactly a week before I ordered this stuff because I was waiting to order from scootertuning.ca I wasn't sure what I would find when I took the top end of the engine apart I wanted to make sure I didn't need anything else before I ordered from those guys I paid similar shipping rates for everything basically the range for shipping here was about eight dollars to sixteen dollars was the range that I paid for shipping on any of this stuff this stuff was ordered one week exactly before I ordered this stuff and this stuff arrived basically one to two days before this arrived so I waited a full week to order this after that and this still arrived within I believe it was actually the next day after the last of this stuff had arrived so that's how good the guys are up at scootertuning.ca in Canada make sure you check them out if you are looking for scooter parts because I haven't found anybody else that can beat their service the bushing failure left big chunks of aluminum on the clutch nut as well as on the drive shaft so I've already chipped away everything that was near the center of these um, with a screwdriver or a chisel and a hammer and I'm hoping that now I'll just be able to remove this nut maybe do a little cleanup to the shaft to make sure it's okay and then replace the nut and that should fix this issue <laughs> You saw me heating the shaft because the aluminum's basically melted in there and I was having a tough time getting it off otherwise. So I heated it up to soften the aluminum and that made it a little easier. But just to show you how tough this stuff is, here's the clutch nut that still has some of that on there. And this is not heated, but here's a chisel and a hammer. You can see it is really melted in there. It doesn't just flake off. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that by now there are probably quite a few of you watching thinking hang on a second isn't he going to replace that messed up crank short answer is no i'm not maybe at some point but right now i'm not i'll begin by saying i don't think this is necessarily the smartest idea and it is not what i advi would advise other people to do however i'm willing to take the risk so what i'm fearful of is that the crank has been scored all the way around here I don't think it really went below where the splines are and really into the center of the crank too much but it's still been scored so this could become a failure point when stress is applied to the crankshaft so basically I'm worried that I could mount the variator and stuff to there get going down the road and then breaks the crankshaft off from that point out um, don't think that would be a whole lot of fun but I'm willing to take the risk a lot of the reason that I'm willing to take that risk is because I'm not very certain of the future of this TPR engine. Obviously I've just replaced this crankshaft 75 miles ago, 
That's kind of irrelevant. If you want something to be reliable, you just have to keep it in a good state of maintenance. However, I don't know if I'm going to do much with this engine beyond getting the Electron in tune and seeing what happens with that. Ultimately, at some point, I would like to try a different setup out. Um, it's basically just limited to the amount of cash that I have, which unfortunately is pretty much nothing right now because I've been breaking everything. But I don't want to put more money into this because I'm starting to feel like the more money I pour into this thing, the more it's holding me back from ever getting away from it and trying something else out. So for right now, I just want to try to keep this crank if I can. I don't want to just set it up how it was, use the same old spacer, put the ramp plate right back in place, and have it sitting just over where it had scored the crankshaft before. I definitely want to move the stress away from that area a little bit, um, at least not have it focused right there. So what I'm thinking is I'll probably cut a new spacer a little bit thinner, and then I'll take one of these keys that's normally in the fixed half of the variator, the drive face, and I'm thinking I can tack weld that to the back of the ramp plate just to lock it into place with the ramp plate. And that should allow me to then, if there is any twisting load, um, that should allow me to put it behind there. The ramp plate would still sit over the scored area or very close to it anyway. It may move a little bit, but that should allow me to move the forces back behind that scored area um, through this key. Now, I don't really think there should be much rotational load, I guess you would call it. I don't know. Um, but I don't think it should be trying to rotate. As long as everything actually stays tight on here and that nut doesn't come loose again or anything, then it should all be locked in by clamping, basically, against the shoulder of the crankshaft with a nut. Um, so I don't think I got a lot to worry about there. In fact, on my old large spline, uh, the 103cc builds and a lot of my other 70cc stuff, um, the overrange variator for that didn't even have splines in there. It was just a hole. So they clearly don't require it to be locked in because those work just fine. But I'm just thinking this is probably the easiest way for me to go about changing that. I do want to point out that there is now wear on the shoulder of this crankshaft all the way around. And if you look at the spacer that was used with it, you can see that there's wear in the center of that where it interacted with the shoulder of the crankshaft. So obviously they kind of twisted and ground against each other and took a little bit of uh, material off of each and damaged each one of those. Here's a close up shot of both cranks, the one that's in there now and the one that I was using. So you can see that the shoulder did look different. It was much flatter, a sharper edge than what I have now where everything is rounded off and it's kind of scored in there a bit. The idea has been proposed that perhaps this spacer is just not hard enough to deal with the stress in there and it's wearing away too much, but I would say because you're seeing both wear on the spacer and wear on the shoulder of the crankshaft that it wouldn't really do me a lot of good to get a harder spacer because then it would just wear the shoulder of the crankshaft down, I would think. It is my opinion that if these two pieces were locked together tightly the nut hadn't came loose on there, they should have never rotated against each other, and the hardness wouldn't have mattered a whole lot there. For that reason, I'm going to go ahead and use this chunk of material that I've got left over from when I made the first spacer. The new spacer is pretty much done, but I need to face it off on this side. The problem is, I realize that when I cut this chamfer or bevel here, that now I can't get it into the chuck of the lathe. So I had this piece of scrap aluminum sitting around, and I just cut that down so it's a press fit into the center of the spacer. I'm going to go ahead and press that on. Hopefully that will hold it tightly enough that I can machine the face and then press that back out of there. My plan is to weld this key to the ramp plate. I've got it mocked up on the crankshaft. I've got a bunch of spacers in place so I could clamp it down. That way I would know all of the splines are aligned properly with both of them. 
and everything should be setting uh, pretty true, pretty flat. But I want to weld this on, see what I've got before I call it done with a spacer since I do have to press it out, etc. I knocked off a couple more spots, checked this thing with a straight edge, and it appears to be flat as far as I can tell. So I shouldn't have to modify my spacer anymore. I'm going to go ahead and try to press that off of the adapter. Unfortunately, this isn't going to work because even when I try to tap this into place, there's still space between the ramp plate or actually that little key on the back of there and the spacer going behind it. The reason this doesn't work is because even though the splines are still back there, they begin to transition into the larger diameter where the spacer sits right up against the shoulder of the crank. So unfortunately i thought i was going to be able to just kind of push that into place and it would still fit over the splines right behind there but it looks like it must change enough that that's not going to work so i've got to have a little bit different plan uh, it looks like i'm pretty close now you can see the edge of that black mark isn't too far off of where the crank is scored. Cutting that with a bit of a taper seems to work. And this goes back and butts up against that spacer. Now I need to focus on the fixed half a little bit because this one, the old one that was on there, Got a little bit chewed up. It's got some spline markings in there. Not really a big deal, most likely, but there is a little bit of play. So just to be on the safe side, I did go ahead and pick up a replacement, and that's a more snug fit onto the end. But the problem with that is I'm going to need to get the new one in the lathe because this is the new one setting up against the old one. You can see that the fins on the old one are shorter. I actually had to machine those down when I first put it in because I don't have room for those fins. They try to run into other things under the CVT cover. So I'm going to have to chop those down a little bit to make clearance. I'm taking this back off because I want to make sure nothing could have compressed or pushed in any further when it was tightened down. After the last episode, it definitely doesn't hurt to be 100% sure what's going on. Everything still looks good. So this time, I'm going to go ahead and put a little thread locker on there. And I think when I do a retorque of the cylinder head, or the cylinder nuts as well as exhaust fasteners probably going to go ahead and do this again as well if you watched the last video you saw that i had trouble with the electron carburetor returning this is the stock spring from the 30 millimeter high velocity electron this is what's included and it's not very stiff but i went on electron's website and they sell springs on there in medium and hard so I picked up both of those um, 
These things are about $7 or exactly $7 each. And then by the time you ship them, it adds another $10.50 something. So it was going to be $18 for one spring or $25 for two. So I just went ahead and picked up both. Largely because uh, I've read some people say that the hard springs are a little too stiff. It's uh, too much effort to pull the throttle. I don't think that would be an issue for me. But given $18 versus $25 for one or two, I just got both just in case. So I'm going to go ahead and install this stiff spring. I also picked up these fluorescent yellow grips from ScooterTuning.ca. My old grips were a bit beat up. And these aren't quite as bold, but they're a pretty decent match for my wheels. At least I've finally got full travel and a carburetor that returns. I think I could probably still benefit from polishing the slide. It could be that this particular 90 degree adapter is a little tight because it does pinch down a little bit on that curve. But it'll work for now. Just did a warm up ride and now I'm waiting for the engine to cool down so that I can retorque the cylinder nuts. But while I'm waiting, I'm going to go ahead and adjust the metering rod. I'm going to move it a quarter of a turn out to lean it out just a little more because it's still breaking up when I get into the throttle quickly. All right, the engine's cooled down to ambient temp again. I've got my torque wrench set to 11.04 newton meters just as it was on assembly. And I'm going to go over all the cylinder studs and just see if they move. So I got maybe eighth to a quarter turn on the first one. About the same on the second one. About the same on the third. The last one. Get this hose out of my way. And probably only an eighth turn on that one. And I'll do one more time just to be sure. It's good. It's good. It's good. All right. So that's all the retorque is for the cylinder head. So basically, if you're thinking about the initial setting, these are at 11.04 newton meters plus an eighth to a quarter of a turn. I went ahead and popped the CVT cover off because as I told you earlier, I wanted to make sure that this nut on here hadn't backed off or nothing was grinding and I didn't create any clearance. I don't feel any play whatsoever in there. Everything seems fine right now. Just to be on the safe side, I'm going to go ahead and take this off, take a real quick look, just make sure nothing looks like it's been grinding even though I really don't think it has been. And then I'll put another bit of thread locker on there and tighten it down again. I think with the taper that I've got on the back of the washer welded to the ramp plate and the taper on the crankshaft, it's almost like a press fit because that thing's pretty tough to get off of there right now. I don't see any evidence of the variator and the spacer at least spinning against each other. No kind of damage there. Crank still looks good. And everything looks good there. I don't see any evidence that that's been rotating. Crank still looks chewed up just like it was before, but nothing new. So I'll go ahead and put this back together.
My CHTs at part throttle just keep getting worse and worse. They're going higher and higher. They may not be awful. I'm not used to seeing it at 200 degrees or near there part throttle. Usually more like 170, 180 part throttle. However, it's still breaking up when I take off. And I'm determined I'm going to see this thing take off clean. So I'm going to go another quarter turn toward lean um, out and see if it gets any better. I'd really like to give it a half turn, but I'm trying to stick with the uh, quarter turn to make sure I don't miss a sweet spot or something. So another quarter turn toward lean. Quarter turn out toward lean. Here's a new one to me. I just tried to back the throttle down the uh, idle speed down a little bit because it was idling high and when I did that now it's locked the throttle. I've got a little bit of scarring there I would have to assume from the idle speed screw. If that's the case since it's right on the edge of this flat spot I would assume I must be about at the edge of the adjustment of that screw. While it's out, I'm going to go another quarter turn toward lean. The last ride was the first one that I've really been hopeful that I can actually get rid of this bog. run was the best one that I've seen as far as sputtering or stumbling on takeoff. So as long as I'm rolling at a decent speed, it takes off pretty clean. When I stopped, I actually got it to take off a couple of times clean, but then sometimes when I'm going slow or taking off from a stop, it wants to bog. So it seems like there's a very fine line there. I just turned the metering rod about an eighth of a turn in to richen it up very slightly. That puts me at about two and sixty three thousandths of an inch for the metering rod length so the last run was two and sixty six thousandths and the one before that where it was stumbling was two and sixty thousandths that puts me right in the middle of those two seems to be my best hope right now for getting it to run uh, strong without bogging so we'll see what happens uh, what the One of the teeth just broke off of this kickstart gear. Luckily, I've got another one around, so it's not going to hold me up. Oh. 
you just saw on the last run, I couldn't get it to take off from a stop at all without it bogging. The only way I could really do anything was to roll into the throttle or use the throttle gently at first. Um, it seemed to have a lot of issues at very low throttle where it would kind of, uh, it was dead on power and then it would pick up suddenly. So really pretty far out of tune, plus all the erratic idle issues that I've been having with the last few metering rod adjustments with it very lean on the metering rod, um, where once the engine's hot, it idles very high. When it's cold, I have a hard time getting it warmed up because I turn the choke on, it runs well with a the choke, then as soon as I turn the choke off, it wants to die, it's idling too low. But then once I get the engine warmed up so the CHTs are actually pretty high, then it's running hot and it doesn't want to slow down. So all sorts of issues. It doesn't seem right at all that I've got such a fine line between sputtering from being rich taking off and bogging from being lean. I mean, we're within a quarter of a turn to an eighth of a turn either way um, and it's doing one or the other. Now, I do think the reason that when I went to the center of those two adjustments, you would think that should work However, that was actually the next day, so the temperature dropped about 5 degrees and the humidity dropped quite a bit, so I'm guessing that the carburetor was just responding to the atmospheric conditions, so it was running a little bit leaner than it normally would uh, because of the air conditions or air quality. But still, very, very thin line between rich and lean, and that doesn't seem right at all to me. If you look at this side of the carb, you can see that the float height or the fuel level is a little bit higher than it should be based on their markings on the bowl. Now it is higher on this side than the other side, just a tiny bit because the carburetor doesn't set a 100% level. But either way, even if I level it out, it doesn't set right where that marking is. I believe it's been pretty much there from the start. Um, but as sort of a last ditch effort before I try to contact Electron or something like that, I'm gonna go ahead and take the carburetor off of there and see if I can get that fuel level to sit right with the lines on the bowl. Maybe that's been what's causing my sputter. Let's find out. Now I've got the carb sitting upside down, flat on its top, on my workbench. And if you look at the float, you can see there's a line going across right there. When you look at that line, you can see that it's not totally parallel with the base of the bowl. It actually kind of goes downward this way, be upward, I guess, if you had the carb upside down, depending which way you look at it. But at any rate, it's not parallel with the base of the carburetor. I don't know that it needs to be parallel based on their settings, but that's a very common setting for float height, float adjustment, is to adjust so that that line would basically run parallel with the base of the carburetor. So that's what I'm going to try to do. When you look at the float, you can see this large metal bracket here, and then right in the center of that is a little tab that sits over top of the float needle. So the way to adjust the float height is by adjusting that tab. Basically, you bend the tab to get it to contact the needle when you want it to. So if I want this float to sit right now upwards, but actually down to lower the fuel level, I need the float to sit more this way then what I would want to do is bend that tab down so that it touches that float needle a little earlier. And that will cut the fuel off before it raises so high in the carburetor. If you wanted to change the float height the other way, you do it the opposite way and you would bend the tab upward. Also, while I'm here, real quick, just be careful when you take this apart because this will come right off of here, so don't lose that. So anyway, you could take the whole float off in order to do this. It looks like I should be able to do this uh, fairly easy, easily with it on the carb. Um, if you did need to take the float off, there's just a pin here. You can pop that out. But I'm just going to raise it up, hold underneath of that metal bracket. I don't want to put pressure on the float itself here. And just push gently down on there to get that to bend a little bit. And then I'm going to check and see where it sits now. Not enough, so I'm going to Try to do that again, a little bit more. So basically you just go back and forth when you're bending that tab, you reset this, take a look at where this line sits on the carburetor until you get that tab bent where you want it. Now, in this case, I didn't get totally parallel with the base of the carburetor. I actually went a little in the other direction so the fuel level will be a little bit lower, but that's kind of where I want it. 
So I'm going to set it right here. You can also go through, you can actually take measurements of the float height or however you choose, but eyeballing it will usually work pretty well. Hopefully you can see, if you look across that tab and here, these were all just totally level with each other. I really didn't have to bend that a whole lot to get the change that I wanted. So you shouldn't have to take a big swing unless your float height is way off. Now I need to reinstall the bowl. The biggest thing to look out for with Electron here is to make sure when you install the bolts before you tighten them up, just be sure that all these little brackets that hold the hoses are oriented how you want them. In my case, this carburetor is a very snug fit into my intake. It takes a little bit of effort to get it in there. So before I install it, I've gone ahead and attached my fuel line. I'm going to turn on my fuel supply, let it fill up the bowl and see where it sits. That way, if it is way off, I don't have to go through getting it in and out of the intake multiple times. With everything leveled out, it's still just a little bit higher than the lines for the level on the bowl. So I'm going to go ahead and take the bowl back off and adjust the float just a bit more. All right, I think I'm pretty much there. It may be just a really tiny bit low when it sits totally level, but it's very close. So I'm gonna go ahead and reinstall the carb. I'm gonna turn the metering rod about a quarter of a turn in to richen it up a little bit because we know that it was bogging where it was with the float height a little higher. So it should definitely bog if I just left it alone. So I'll start with a quarter of a turn. We'll see where that goes. I wanted to be sure that I didn't have anything else strange going on that could be causing it, like maybe a weak spark. I noticed that my spark plug cap was a little bit loose, so I went ahead and replaced the spark plug cap. I also replaced the spark plug just to be safe, though it doesn't look like the old spark plug was fouled. bogging on takeoff right now does fine from a roll i'm hoping that the bogging on takeoff with a little richer metering rod setting is telling me that maybe this float adjustment has made some difference don't know that it's saying anything yet i'm going to take kind of a bigger swing at it and go a half a turn in on the metering rod i know you should stick to smaller adjustments but i'm really not trying to spend my entire life doing this i really just want to see if i'm making any difference or not <laughs> There's a little bit of a stumble, nothing too bad. I'm gonna go another quarter of a turn in on the metering rod and find out if that gets better or worse. That showed some promise. It definitely felt good taking off. There is some hesitation from a roll, but I'm still gonna richen this up another quarter of a turn on the metering rod and see if it can deal with that or if that's too much. going over the info, it looks like the 2 and 36 thousandths of an inch metering rod setting worked the best for me. I got down to 3.4 seconds, 0 to 30 on average. Uh, my best time recorded on average was 3.3, and it would probably take a lot of work with a CVT to get right there again, so I don't expect it to necessarily be there. But it looks like my throttle response is good there. It feels good, it sounds good to me when it takes off. So. 
The next best was two and forty-four thousandths. So I'm thinking I'm going to try two and forty thousandths right halfway between those two settings. That's going to be the last one I believe I'm going to try with a metering rod um, and just see if that does any better or if I end up going back to the other setting. But I'm going to need to work with a power jet for sure. After zero to thirty it falls off quite a bit based on my best times in the past. Um, at least three to four tenths of a second from zero to forty and fifty. Uh, but it's obvious to me that it's not right on the top end. The, when I hold wide open throttle for a while, I can definitely feel that it's not smooth. So I think the power jet setting is going to need to be gone over again, which I would expect with the metering rod changing very much uh, and changing the float height. But first, I'm going to focus on just checking and seeing if the metering rod setting can get any better with that eighth turn setting or not. While I'm in here, I realized that a problem that I was having is actually easily fixed. So I was complaining that I couldn't get the idle set right, and I'd actually screwed the screw all the way in and it still wouldn't idle high enough for me lately. And then when I actually took a look at this, instead of just quickly uh, taking it in and out and not really paying attention, I realized that what's happening is the uh, idle speed screw is pushing against this flat section right here and kind of digging in and that's what's jamming the throttle up when I try to push it in but that's actually not where it should be set if I wanted a high idle. If I wanted a high idle I should see that the screw was contacting further down here along this ramp. So all I really have to do is pull the throttle up a little bit and then turn the screw in so that it's not jamming in against the flat spot here on the slide. So that was my mistake and I believe it should be fixed with just doing that. quite as well on that last setting so I'm going back to two and forty four thousandths of an inch which is my previous best setting. I'm going to try to leave it alone unless some other issue comes up and now I want to focus on working on the power jet because obviously when I hold it wide open throttle the last bit of the throttle is pretty far off. I can't actually hold it there without it uh, getting very rough kind of breaking up on me. So since I know it's pretty far off I'm going to go ahead and make a half turn adjustment I'm going to turn it a half turn out so it richens it up. That'll be six and a quarter turns out now. Um, it may be the wrong way, but I'd rather move toward rich because it's safer. And I'm taking bigger half, uh, half turn swings because it is so far out right now. I just want to get in the ballpark quickly and then try to narrow it down with quarter or less adjustments. <laughs> Definitely worse, so I'm going to go a full turn in to five and one quarter turns out. And that is because I just came from uh, five and three quarters. Very slow. 
slowly. Going another half a turn in. That's down to two and a quarter, I don't know. kind enough to restart for me. I'm going to do a couple of quick 0 to 50s out here with a one turn out just to see if it's better or worse or what it is versus before. Oh joy. Kick starts out really good. Alright. I think my kickstart might be messed up. It actually messed up earlier today, or yesterday really. Um, didn't even bother to put it on camera. I just took it apart and turned out the spring inside of there had come off of a little hook. It wasn't returning or acting right at all, but wasn't a big deal to repair. I'm not so sure that it hasn't done that again. Seems to work okay. That's kind of screw up there. But I don't think it meshes right with this other gear. And binds like hell for some reason. I was just saying to the guys on the forum that I think. Uh, a lot of these parts that I get that are supposed to be replacement don't necessarily uh, fit exactly perfect like stock did. Plus who knows what stock is because I don't even know what this cover came off of, the CVT cover. So who knows what was supposed to go in there. You can see this thing doesn't even want to go back. Now I've got the freaking screw jammed in there. There we go. Clearly not a great kick start that up. Alright, let's see if it wants to start now. Oh, this just totally breaks. Oh, that's lovely. I 
this is getting anywhere. I can kick it, but I can't really get a good kick. This thing always takes a pretty decent kick to get it going since I put this electron on for some reason. Nope. Well, here we go again. See if I can get another ride home in the truck. After some additional attempts to kick start it before I called for a truck, you can see that the spring did come off of the peg up there. But when I got home, I found that it was what I suspected. So here is the uh, gear that I was using with it. And you can see when I'm trying to, if I hold this in and try to push on the lever, it really resists spinning. It will spin, but it's very tough. In comparison, here is another gear that I had around. Now watch this. If I hold some pressure on there, it spins freely. No problem. So as I said on the side of the road, I think that some of these parts are just not machined exactly perfect or made exactly perfect and don't fit how they should. I got the new gear in there. I got a new spring in there. Kickstart seems to work all right, but I think I've got bigger problems. Notice I'm not using a whole lot of effort here, just using a couple fingers to move the kick lever. Not as much resistance as there should be on that. So I'm kind of afraid I've got low compression. I'm gonna go ahead and set up a compression tester and find out for sure. It looks like a little over 60 PSI. When it's in good condition, it should be 165 to 170 PSI. So safe to say, very low compression. It's rough to say the least around the edge of the piston crown, especially right over here. The rest of it, not nearly as bad. I've got that ring that I typically have around my pistons. Um, this time it's a little more sandblasted and textured than normal. Usually it's just a lighter colored or a piece of the outside edge of the crown that's not really colored. Um, but right now I can actually really feel a sandpaper gritty kind of texture all around there but yeah it's pretty much destroyed over here little chunks missing out of it um, obviously the piston ring is trapped in there because of that so it pretty much totally lost compression because of that the lack of coloring around the edges as well as the in this case severe erosion on the edges of the piston crown are usually from lean mixtures too much ignition advance, or just generally the engine overheating. Um, in this case, I have seen this before. As I said, it's something that happens in all my engines that I usually have a uh, lack of color right around the edges. I know that I'm running three degrees advanced versus the initial uh, MVT ignition setup specs. And I have ran it lean part throttle at times with the old carb, but this carburetor runs way more lean um, I would have to say it's likely to be due to that because I'm seeing over 200 degrees part throttle cylinder head temperatures when normally I would see 170, 180, something like that if I'm cruising around. I try to keep it around there. Uh, it's got a lot more fuel being delivered at that point. It's usually sputtering. But with Electron, it has ran super clean at part throttle. Great response everywhere through the throttle. However, I don't think it's delivering enough fuel as I have it set up to take off hard and I'm not willing to have it bog off the line in order to have it run decent at part throttle so I can cruise around. It doesn't seem like the kind of thing that I should have to compromise on because I don't have to compromise on that with my much cheaper uh, Del Orto 25mm carburetor so I definitely don't feel like I should have to compromise on that with this. It's most likely that I need to get in touch with Electron and see if uh, they can suggest a different metering rod for me. 
but you can see that it must be running hot because I normally don't have any sort of ash or discoloration on the bottom of the piston crown and hopefully it shows up in the camera properly with the uh, reflection but there's definitely a uh, brown area here underneath the crown that I don't normally have so it's, it's certainly been hotter than it normally is. Luckily the cylinder looks alright or at least I don't see anything obvious at a glance. It also looks like I may have had another leak as well. You can see clearly nothing there. Everywhere else you can see the contact. But I'm going to go ahead and clean all these up in a little bit and take precision measurements of these because I'm going to have to figure out what size piston I need to replace this. Uh, I'm just not sure how much wear the cylinder has on it. It has, let's see, 474 miles on this cylinder right now, the whole kit. Um, so maybe it'll need the same piston it had, but this was a B cylinder and B piston from Top Performance. They don't stock B, C, or D that I know of. Last time I asked, it takes four to six weeks to get a hold of anything other than an A piston. So it's probably going to be a while before I can get this back together. I also wanted to show you my water pump because the coolant came out very, very dirty this time. Uh, even worse than it was the last time. But I'm suspecting that the water pump has at least something to do with it. It could be the leak from that cylinder. But if you look at this, that's not good. Hopefully you can see the bearing is actually moving in the housing very easily. And I've got some nasty gunk all around there. So I've ordered two entire water pump assemblies because I rebuilt this thing once. Um, it seems like the housing itself was actually worn out though. I can get these for about $35, roughly $40 shipped. Um, so I just ordered two of them. Um, it'll just be a replacement part. I was thinking about going to look for another pump, maybe one of the fancy uh, billet aluminum pumps or something to see if they were any better. But for right now, I'm just going to replace it. I don't really want to go through a whole testing process or anything. So I'll be replacing that when I get the engine back together also. I guess I'm going to wrap this video up here because it's pretty obvious I'm not going to get anything done right away. I do want to say, I mentioned earlier that I believe that some of this failure could be because of the Electron. I should clarify that. Yes, I do believe the Electron is causing it to run very lean at part throttle for how I have to set it so that I can get rid of the bog or the hesitation on takeoff. But realistically, the carb is an inanimate object. I am responsible for that. Uh, I've been thinking I probably should have contacted Electron to talk with them about a richer metering rod or a metering rod that would allow it to be more rich at part throttle when I was cruising around. I just didn't do it. I was trying to see if I could get it in tune as is. Um, so I'm not blaming Electron by any uh, stretch of the imagination. I'm just saying that I think the circumstances surrounding this uh, probably had a lot to do with why the piston is chewed up there on the edges. As always, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe for more if you've enjoyed the videos, found them entertaining, or found them helpful.